You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Vuelta España in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. Uh, I'm in Spain and I'm with Daniel Freib. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Daniel. Actually in person. Like travel. Yeah, it's air the first travel. First time in a couple of months, isn't it? Anyway. Well, you know, you've been floating around, haven't you, Willow the Wisp? Um, let's let's get straight to Lionel. Will we? Lionel, even though he's not here, is going to be doing the daily tale of the etapa. So Lionel's somewhere in Watford. Hey, Lionel's kept a very low profile if he is here today. I've not seen him. <laughs> not even anywhere near that. Very nice buffet. Anyway, over to you, Lionel, for the tale of the etapa. Thank you. Glad you've made it to the Vuelta, Richard. In time to see stage seven to Puebla de Sanabria. The last chance for the rulers and sprinters before the climbers take over for the best part of a week. An early break of six was caught with 44 kilometres to go, which meant there was plenty of time for another dangerous looking move to go away in the last 30 kilometres. Astana's Dario Cataldo started it and he was joined by teammate Luis Leon Sanchez, who was second yesterday. Gianluca Brambila of Etix, who won a stage of the Giro. Simon Clark of Cannondale Drapak and Luis Angel Mate of Kofidis, who had also been in the earlier six-man move. The lead was just 30 seconds with 15 kilometres to go, and as the others sat up, Luis Leon Sanchez and Simon Clark refused to give in, and they battled onto the line even though the odds were against them, and they were caught with only 300 metres to go. The bunch sprint was won by I Am Cycling's Jonas van Genechten, ahead of Daniele Bernati of Tinkoff and Alejandro Valverde. Van Genechten is reportedly joining Cofidis next year because I Am Cycling are stopping at the end of the season. However, they've signed off in real style, winning stages of all three Grand Tours this season, after Roger Kluger's win at the Giro and Harlinson Pantano's at the Tour. So far, only Sky, Etix and Orica can say that they've done that. There was a crash on the final right-hand corner with 600 metres to go and Alberto Contador came off worst, scuffing his left side. Chris Froome was also caught up in the crash, but he remained third overall and didn't appear to be badly hurt. No change overall. Darwin Atapuma in red. Jenny Mearsman leads the points. Alexandra Genies is the king of the mountains. And Atapuma also leads the combined classification. A few abandons to report. Michal Kwiatkowski of Sky pulled out with back pain. Ryan Tarame is also out with his Katusha team claiming he he was hit by another team car. So tomorrow, a first category summit finish and the climbers will come to the fore. Hope you're enjoying it out there, Richard. Speak to you soon. Thanks for that, Lionel. It wasn't it wasn't the most thrilling of stages, but as with every stage, there was certainly uh, there were certainly incidents, weren't there? Certainly talking points, not least uh, Alberto Contador, more rotten luck for him at the end there. I should have asked you, uh, Daniel, in the absence of Lionel, where are we? We are outside the press room in Puebla de Sanabria. Are we out of Galicia at last? We're in Castilla y León, I think. I'm yeah. pretty sure we are. In fact, we just crossed the border, didn't we? About 20 kilometres before the finish. I think we did, yeah. So, um, what did we make of today's stage, Daniel? No, it was it was one where it didn't look like an awful lot was going to happen. Um, the winner, I mean, I was standing with you at the finish line, and we, we both, we, we, let's admit it, we both turned to each other and said, who, who was that? Yeah, I think we Fair said to describe else. him as I think <laughs> it was, that was similar to what we said. <laughs> Fair to describe him as a journeyman pro, to a certain extent. But it, he's someone who's getting better every year. He won his his career really started to kick into gear a couple of years ago. Um, he won a, a stage of the Tour of Poland, if I'm not mistaken, um, GP for me, and he is getting better every season. And um, he's the latest I am cycling rider to really stir to life post the announcement that That's the team was going to be discontinued and was going to end at the at the end of the season stages in all three grand tours that they've won this year this is this is van genichten is that correct this is his first grand tour at the ripe old age of 29 turns 30 in a couple of weeks started off as a bmx rider and then was a mountain biker and um, very handy with his stunts on the bike and pull a mean wheelie yeah i mean he's kind of typical of the I am riders. They've got a lot of. Well, it's, it's a fairly motley bunch of uh, of talented riders who haven't seemed to gel particularly well together, and that's maybe borne out by the fact they have ridden very well um, when they've really been well riding for themselves. I suppose uh, you, you have to think that uh, a lot of them have been trying very hard to put themselves personally in the shot window, and um, it's probably been quite difficult to manage. And it might also be. A little bit of an indictment on 
um, some of the tactics that have been employed and some of the efforts that have been made to to gel them together over the past couple of years because um as as we've said they since the giro really when roger kluger won the stage um and even heinrich hausler sort of stirred to life there as well and um you know the tour de france jarlins and pantano and here and there have been a lot of other occasions as well other races where they've been very very prominent even yesterday Matthias frank um and they've ridden kind of out of character it, it's um, they've sort of come out of their shell, a lot of these riders. Um, they've, they ridden, seem they've ridden as if they've got nothing to lose, exactly. which in a sense they don't. You know, they're 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 you know, Larry Warbass wrote a, a blog um, for Ruler at the start at the start of this Vuelta about how you know he will be he's fighting. You know, they're all fighting. They're fighting for their futures in the sport. And a, and a guy like Van Genichten, he's not a guy who would be given the leadership role in any team, is he? Um, and yet he is. He's clearly got a decent finish. You know, that was a very very good win today on a hard finish, and he's got a good a good kick at the at the end like that. And Richard, as you say, they've been riding as though they've been fighting for their lives, which is in a way ironic in the sense that this team, the whole founding principle of this team, or one of this team's key policies which was one year contracts was that they were all going to be fighting for their lives at all times but it just hasn't looked like that and it hasn't been the case until the moment when um, the owner of the team uh, Michel Tiaz um, announced in May that he was pulling out. Well it was a stage that sort of came to life in the last 30 kilometres or so Astana really drilled it on the front um, and it was all for Luis Leon Sanchez who went away on the final climb as Lionel told us um, countering a move by Dario Cataldo a few others went across and one of them was Simon Clark and Simon Clark also had a go a couple of days ago and it looked good he I mean Canada are fighting for their lives in a way as well because they need something from this race and Simon Clark is the perfect candidate for a, a stage like today. He had a real a real go. Him and Luis, Luis Leon Sanchez were caught in the final sort of 50, 60 metres or so of the stage. Um, I spoke to Simon Clark at the finish. Here he is. I think we can see the effort that that, that took out of you. Did you think you had it there? Ah, uh, look, to be honest, Luis, as you probably saw, did most of the work. Ah... Uh, I just tried to help him as much as I could. Uh, on a finish like that into a headwind, it's pretty easy to see who's the strongest. Uh, he definitely was. and uh, Honestly, I was just riding for second place realistically, but uh, I feel sorry for him. He was so strong today and he deserved a win after second yesterday as well. So. Yeah, there was a good dig you made the other day as well. You've had a couple of, uh, you know, made a couple of efforts to, to win stages. You know, I guess that, that's your personal goal here, is it, at the Vuelta? Yeah, look, I trained really hard for the Olympics after I got the call up, and I really uh, pushed the limits in my training there. So I didn't want to just race the Olympics and then stop with the effort that I put in. And so the team uh, accepted my request to come here to the Vuelta and. I'm here to prove that I was worth the spot. It's a strong team you've got here. You've been very active, always had men in the breaks and so on. Are you, uh, you know, optimistic? It's been a disappointing year at the Grand Tour for, for Candy. Are you optimistic that this team is going to, you know, do something at this well? To... Look, I'm not going to project what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. We're, every team has their routine and, and a process, and we go through that process and try and achieve the best result possible. So the Simon Clark there, he was, he was, uh, he was absolutely exhausted, as you'd expect, but he was in a quite a state and had to wait a while before he was able to to speak. And uh, you know, it's not often you find yourself in a in a in a stage winning position in a Grand Tour. It was realistic that Luis and Sanchez was going much better than him, and had they stayed away, he'd have he'd have probably come second. But you know, you don't get many chances. He's sort of had two, and. Uh, you know, that, I did sort of ask him about the, the, the rest of the team's prospects. He wasn't really biting on that because, as I said before we heard the interview there, um, there's a bit of pressure on them, I think. Yeah, and they've really come to this t to this race with the heavy artillery. I mean, they've got a very strong team, a lot of big name riders, a lot of riders that need to save their seasons, really, or quite a few anyway. Uh, Davide Formal always not had the best season; he was okay in the Giro, but um, he's here. They got Pierre Roland, who of course was very unlucky in the Tour de France. They got Talansky, um, who needs to save his season. But just going back to Clark, um, I was I was f intrigued and slightly baffled when at the start of the season Cannondale signed him, and they sort of build him as as their new road captain. Now I don't really see Simon Clark in that kind of vein I think Simon 
Clark's an excellent rider when he's um, really given a lot of freedom and he's um, allowed to show the kind of opportunistic streak that he's shown a couple of times this week but he doesn't really strike me as, as someone you would use and almost waste as a road captain I think it depends on the race it depends it? on the definition of road captain and as well at the Giro as Joe Dombrowski told us um, he was an excellent road captain he felt he was very good at sort of marshalling the troops and they, that was a team at the Giro with a very specific objective it was to help Rigoberto Iran so it wasn't one where Clark would necessarily have his own chances and let's face it Cannondale would know better than me whether he's a good road captain or not <laughs> <laughs> look we've been joined by a fan's favourite Francois Tomaso, a friend from the Tour de France. Francois, what brings you to the Vuelta? Mm, it's my second Vuelta, actually, and I'm, I'm working a little bit for the organisers. They need to get quotes in the morning and quotes in the, in the evenings, and I write the uh, official race summaries in French and English as well. How's your bullshit radar? <laughs> I, I try not to put too, many, too much bullshit in the official communiques. Um, can can I, I put something through the bullshit radar? <laughs> Darwin, you can, of course. D- Darwin Atapuma being very, very diplomatic about losing teammates and his teammates all going back to, or most of them going back to help Samuel Sanchez. He put a very brave face on that. Um, but that struck me as something that might fall foul of your bullshit <laughs> radar. And my, my other problem in the world is I don't know how to say bullshit in Spanish. <laughs> Toro or something, no? <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> um, it's been a good uh, Vuelta so far for the for the French, though, Francois. It's it's been surprisingly good for the for the French. I I suppose it's not so surprising. The French do well usually on the Vuelta, especially. How could I say not unheralded, but you know, maybe uh, Seri, Seri B, as they say here, um, uh, French riders, because it's so much pressure on the tour that it's much much more difficult. The, the French don't handle the pressure too well, and here you know it's it's open. You've got like 20, 25 riders uh, f- going for the GC, and for the rest of the uh, of the guys, it, it's it's wide open. So the French were lucky to to take the right breaks and and to be good enough to to to. You know, go ahead and win them. Uh, Genius, it was not his first. He won a stage on the world already. So, you know, not not a real surprise. He's a good rider. I, I think he's been a little bit wasted this last couple of years. And, and he had his health problems like everybody else. And uh, Lilian Calmejan is a very, very gifted young rider. Uh, I think he, he, he himself is not aware of uh, how good he is. Well, I think he realized, but maybe uh, with his stage win, that is, is much better than he thought. So, Generally speaking, even in the sprints, we have a couple of French riders who are doing okay in the top 10. But I mean, the sprints here are, you know, it's the same as the world are generally. It's very wide open. So, yeah, it's a bit of a surprise, but not so much of a surprise because, you know, uh, everybody has its chance and, uh, the, and the French are, you know, not as bad, not as good as the, the rest of the field. Francois, can I just ask you a question about Genies? He's going to AG2R Le Mondial next year. Mm-hmm. Is that purely to be Roman Bardet's water carrier, or is he going to get his own uh, freedom? I, my impression is that uh, AG2R Le Mondial are, are, are really trying to build a team. Not, well, you know, the, the team Sky influence is enormous, and, 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 and lots of teams now uh, are emulating what, uh, what Team Sky are doing. And, and, and my impression that is the recruiting, they, uh, because AG2 are, are recruiting Matthias Frank as well and um, other riders of that caliber. So, very, very strong, solid uh, climbers uh, who could be leaders on, uh, you know, in their own terms. So, my impression is that the, the number one uh, priority for AG2R will be to to have riders to uh, to support uh, Romain Bardet on the tour. Now well, I, I talked to Matthias Franck yesterday, and he was telling me that on on other races like Paris or Tirreno or, or uh, races in Switzerland, uh, you know, guy, guys like him or maybe Genies could could have their their chances. The problem with Genies, I think, is is probably. You know, he's probably wasted his chances to 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 make a career for for himself. Maybe because he was a little bit injured. Maybe because FDJ uh, did not always you know put uh, a lot of trust in him because he's a shy guy because he he lacks self confidence. Much as Frank was saying exactly the same. He said, you know, I'm happy to leave. Uh, uh, Yam, in a way, well, he's not living in Yam Cycling. Now, Yam Cycling won't exist next season. But he said, "This way, I won't be in the spotlight anymore." And some some riders just don't like the spotlight. And I think Genius is one of those. And and he probably is better when he's not expected. So, uh, my impression is, if AG Tour ever ever, you know, a um, plan B, it's Pierre Latour. They, they've said, 
very early in this Vuelta that is the, the leader here and is what 22 and is uh, is uh, um, very promising. Uh, it, Julien Jordi, the team director, even told me is childish, you know. So, but I want to try him as a leader very early on, so that he, he gets the to know how to position himself as a leader, and that's the plan as far as I'm concerned. Eurosport, the home of cycling. Thank you very much to Eurosport for sponsoring the cycling podcast. Today, today we're broadcasting the Tour de l'Avenir. You were mentioning before the break there, Francois Pierre Latour, 22 years old. Tour de l'Avenir is the shop window for a lot of the the young riders, and uh, a Frenchman uh, is looking very strong. Uh, David Godu, 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 yeah, is uh, 19. Yeah, is. Uh, uh, Marc Madio spotted him, you know, at a, at a small race, and he said, and apparently he called a few friends, and his brother said, "Guys, I've spotted one of the best uh, guys I've seen since uh, I discovered Philippe Gilbert." So the con- comparison, and he said he, he he's nondescript, you know, he's uh, he's ugly on a bike, he looks like a, uh, you know, uh, like a small bird. I mean, he has he has nothing special, but he's he, he's very special, he's very strong, and and Madio, uh, you know, has the eye for that, and he said, you know, watch out for this guy, we really must uh, sign him, and well, obviously, it's it's paying off. He's looking like he might win that. I, I meant to say it's broadcast today on uh, Eurosport Tour de l'Avenir, and also the final stage on Saturday. Speaking of 19-year-olds or teenagers at the Tour de l'Avenir, of course you're going to miss out, the French are going to miss out on Adrian Costa, aren't they? I think he's going to represent the USA, is that right? I think that is right. He's eligible for French. both. His anyway. parents are French. Yeah, we've got an interview um, that we'll play with him in, uh, in the future. He's he's um, lying third overall at the moment, but yeah, he's he's 19. He's just turned 19. So um, two of the youngest guys in the race, really, in first and third overall. Great, great prospects for the future. Um, so back to the Vuelta, which of course is on Eurosport every day. I've arrived armed with some Peddler de Charme t-shirts, so we'll ramp up Peddler de Charme now that I'm here. Um, sent me three three extra smalls and two mediums, so I'm going to have to find some burly riders before we get to the high mountains <laughs> and get rid of these t-shirts. Um, but on the overall uh, in the overall picture today, the, the talking point, I suppose, was Alberto Contador. Is he unlucky or is there something else going on? I think this is, this is classic. This is typical of what happens to riders when they're losing... Well, some of their strength, they're losing some of their confidence, they're losing, you know, some of their their knack of being in the right position. I think it, it it often happens to riders when they're really stretched at the end of their career, trying to hold on to something or the vestiges of of their old ability. And um, or it could just be a coincidence, but it doesn't look like a, a coincidence, does it, that he's falling so much? And he looked bashed up. I mean, he fell on the same side that he hurt at the tour. His shoulder looked bad, and and you know he was unhappy, I think, and, yeah. and worried. And he was complaining about pain in his calf in particular. I think that was one of the, the major problems. You know, it, it wasn't studying the, 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 the slow-mo. It, it wasn't his fault. And he was in the right place. He was in the place that, that everybody's told to be, near the front. Uh, uh, some riders came up the inside of him and he was basically hit. Uh, I, I was told by Romain Hardy, another French rider who finished ninth, that uh, Bagdonas was the guy who, uh, you know, p- t- took him to the uh, to the canvas, as you say in boxing. Well, it works, <laughs> it. Uh, and... Um, yeah, the, the the thing is, I agree 100 percent with what the Daniel just said. Uh, maybe uh, it's 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 painful to write off uh, Alberto Contador. He's been such a probably the, the the greatest talent of the past 10 or 15 years. But you know, it, it doesn't happen by chance. When you, when you crash uh, so many times, when you miss so many chances, I think it's a little bit. Yeah, it's probably a little, a little bit under. You know, sport. A, a, a great skier once told me, you know, skiing is all about knowing your limits and try to 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 be just, uh, just, well, at the the edge, but not over the edge. Because if you are over the edge, you crash, and, and that's that's probably what what's what maybe what's happening with Alberto. We 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 would hate to see him, you know, pull out or. Well, not be as good as it could be, but unfortunately, you know that that's the way things go. Once again, we have this problem. We had crashes uh, on this Vuelta in the final. Uh, in the finale, there's been quite a few. It's not nothing new. Unfortunately, we won't, you know, come back on the uh, bollard uh, problem in Lugo. But um, I was discussing with Neil Stevens about it, and 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 the same questions uh, arise again and again. What can you do? Should 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 times be taken at the last three Ks, you know, every time so that, you know, guys, leaders like uh, Contador from w- wouldn't have to be in, in, in this position. It's, it's, it's an, I don't know, it's an endless, uh, you know, controversy. 
Yeah, and among those suggestions that we've heard this year many times is um, smaller pelotons, smaller teams. But you know, today there was really no excuse. It wasn't a big group going in there, was it? And uh, you know, Philippe Gilbert was very upset at the finish. I spoke to him about the GC riders and the GC teams getting too involved and and causing confusion and chaos in the finale. But uh, like I said, how many how many guys finished together? Was it 20, yeah. 30? Um, it shouldn't have been dangerous. 95 actually have all been given the same oh, time right. on okay. the stage. So it was a big, big old group. Um, and I was studying that last, you know, three cases to see because it was quite a test thing. And it's the kind of um, finish where there, there might be splits. And if you take the time on the 3K to go mm. um, barrier, it renders meaningless the final three kilometers where... You know, and, and then there's when's the, where's the incentive for organisers to put in little climbs or, you know, I, I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about it. I can see the, the point of view um, of, of just taking the time at 3K and then the, the GC guys can just sit up and meander in. But to me, that would take something away from the racing. And, and the point of the race is that the race is to the line, isn't it? So I don't really know what the answer is. And, and Contador also made a comment about apparently people don't like braking anymore but you know again that's part of the risk reward isn't it and, and if you get a rider who who doesn't brake and who thinks that he can you know gain a few positions by not braking then all power to him really and um you know if, if he's going to make if that particular rider is going to make up a few seconds doing that then you know if that's he can part do of the it game safely, and if he can do it safely th th his peers will let him know that's the other thing there, there are checks and balances there aren't there within the peloton i mean the, the dangerous riders are told that they're dangerous and they're in the tour, there was kind of a gentleman agreement. Uh, so, so we heard, you know, when Sagan ma made his point that, you know, the, some riders shouldn't be there. Uh, apparently, the problem was solved uh, straight away because the, there was a kind of, uh, you know, pact in the peloton that some guys uh, w wouldn't be so too close to the sprinting positions. Ma maybe the, it's a problem that, that, should, that you know, they, they should solve together uh, at some stage, saying, OK, guys, you know, go and have your day. But today was different because you had Ali Rano Valverde sprinting for both the stage win and maybe the red jersey so so which meant that the bmc should shouldn't be too far and it, it was no yeah I, i'm as you say i'm i'm not sure the 3k to go uh, solution would be the one the, the, is there one uh, i doubt it actually and, and i think as cycling evolves professional cycling evolves and particularly becomes more global the days of these gentlemen's agreements is a slowly fading away because i think it's just you know, simply unmanageable for such a diverse peloton to develop any kind of consensus. You know, the Vuelta and the Giro, they both used to be contested almost, well, 80% by um, home teams. Everyone was speaking the same language, and I just don't think the riders really speak to each other that much. Well, listen, at the finish, I spoke to Dave Brailsford, the team Sky principal, um, just about Chris Froome, really, also about Mikhail Kwiatkowski, the Polish rider who had to abandon today. So I started off by asking him about about him. Here he is, Dave Brailsford. So first of all, Dave, uh, Kwiatkowski out of the race. Um, I gather he had a, a back problem. Yeah, uh, it's really disappointing on that one. He, um, he'd actually had a saddle sore um, for the for a couple of days. Well, it was it was more it was nearly saddle sore, Chapin. But um, regardless, I think that then, you know, when the, when the guys get that, they tend to maybe unconsciously just tilt a little bit to one side, protect themselves a little bit. And um, came back on a bus yesterday, and then uh, we had a long transfer, go back to the hotel, and then it kind of had a back spasm really, where he just locked up. And um, so the guys treated it, and you know, he got up this morning, had a go, but it wasn't. Um, yeah, it was too painful, and so unfortunately he's had to pull out, which is uh, disappointing. Must be disappointing for him as well, because this was his his one Grand Tour this year. Yeah, exactly, and I think it's been. It's been I think it sums up his season, to be honest. I think you know we every uh, for every um, step forward, you know, we get a step backwards. I mean, obviously he, he had some good results early on, um, but I think the thing that we were looking for here and himself, you know, was just that little bit of consistency. Nothing great, nothing bad just a nice solid performance and uh, unfortunately um, we're not going to get that but we'll, we'll see how quickly he recovers I don't think it'll be a long term thing and, um, and hopefully we can recalibrate and still get something out at the end of the season How about Chris? I mean he seems to be in, in good form how would you compare his form where he's at compared to the Tour de France? Well I think that's a good question insofar as I don't think you can compare and I, I, I'll, I'll tell you why The uh, well I'll, my interpretation of why so we come into the Tour de France and you want to go in there absolutely pinging. You know, you're ready, you're, you're built towards it, you're fresh and, and you really go into it when you're feeling completely on it. And then 
post that coming into the welter you've obviously had the tour where you competed right the way through to the end you've got to travel to rio rio come back uh, a couple of days and then straight into um straight into the welter so i think if you go in expecting to feel the same you might absolutely ping in it's unlikely that's going to happen so i think you know from a general sort of mindset point of view you've got to come in there with a bit more okay we're going to we're going to build into this as against hitting the ground running and um and i think i think it's fair to say that chris a little bit you know, as all riders, you've got to get on a bike and get a couple of stages in your leg before you really know where you're at. But I think he's been very pleasantly surprised, and uh, he's, he's, um, he, the, the way he's feeling on the bike and the way he's climbed and the way he's performed so far has uh, has been great. How much does he want it? I mean, he he doesn't need it. You know, the tour is something that that that's really the thing that drives him the most. But how much does he want to win this world? He, yeah, he, he wants it. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I think the at the start of the season we looked at the combination of uh, Tour, Rio and um, the Welter it was being sort of, sort of three goals together as it were and, and is it possible to go and do all three you know he's won the Tour, he's got a medal out of Rio and um, and here he is embarking on you know the sort of more decisive stages of the of the Welter and uh, I think that's one of his greatest strengths you know, his, his, his mentality and his, his mental um, robustness, if you like, and that, that just you know, n- never-ending desire to to want it and fight and, and challenge for the win. It's um, it's quite remarkable, really. Can I ask you a final question, Dave? A lot of talk after the tour about uh, reducing the sizes of teams. Now, I'm I'm imagining that you wouldn't be in favour of that. So, can I ask you if you were the if you were the director of the Tour de France, would you be in favour of that? I think I'd be in favour of looking at. at um, all options really I think you know well, you've got to go back and think okay what was why was the race like it was was the single cause of the, of, of the race being like it was nine riders are than eight riders I would say personally that it probably wasn't a bigger contributing factor to the way the race was ridden this year as many are making out however I'm not I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't consider all options going forward to make the sport more exciting and uh, a greater spectacle I think reducing it to um, I think you could, if you reduce it by one rider per team, I think that would be um, okay. But I don't think it would get the. Uh, I don't think it would have the impact that people would hope for. Um, and equally, I think if you reduce it too far, I think you've also then got to start thinking about uh, the performance side of it from from the teams and the riders' perspective, and what you're asking guys to do, and and, and the nature of the race in that respect. So I think there's um, like like all of these things, you can take a very very quick. You know, quick decision, quick reaction. It's a bit like the race radios, isn't it? Let's stop race radios and racing will be all exciting. It'll be all fantastic. And then we got them back again, you know. So I think there needs to be a, a, a greater depth of thinking and you think through the permutations and the sort of cause and effect before just jumping on the bandwagon and saying it should be a good idea. But we should look at everything. Whoever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason... Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. See rafa.cc for more information. Thank you very much to Rafa for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. And we heard before that little break from uh, Dave Brailsford speaking about, uh, first about Mikhail Kwiatkowski. And I think you had something to say about Kwiatkowski, the vanity signing, Daniel. Do you feel vindicated? <laughs> Well, slightly. He hasn't had the best year. I mean, it's not exactly an Anas Horribilis. He did win Het Newsblad, didn't he? And he did really... E3, wasn't it? E3. Was it E3 or, or Het Newsblad? Het Newsblad. It was E3. E3, E3. E3. sorry. Sorry, E3. Of correct, course, yeah, correct. Van Avermaet. Um, and he did show abilities in the Cobble Classics that we didn't know he had. And maybe that's the future direction of his career. Maybe that's the only place that he's going to get the, the freedom and the latitude he needs at Team Sky. I don't know. I mean, it's a bit of a puzzle for them to solve over, over the winter because it certainly... It hasn't been plain sailing in that relationship between Kwiatkowski and Sky this year. Tricky one to manage, isn't it? There's something else we want to speak to Brailsford, I think, about how you keep guys like him happy. Um, it's a tough one. You know, is, is he happy coming to the Vuelta? I mean, it probably was, but would he not have liked to have been at the Tour? But then had he gone to the Tour, he would have been merely a number in the Team Sky machine. I asked Dave Brailsford there as well about team sizes and you know whether he was whether if he was the director of the Tour, he'd be in favour of, of a, a, you know, reducing the, the size of teams he kind of skirted the answer a little bit um, but he was speaking about Chris Froome too and bit just confirming what we can all see with our own eyes that Froome is in, is in good form and, and wants to win the Vuelta I think that's that's pretty obvious um, to all of us he looks and you know once again he uh, 
he comes through a stage like that unscathed and untroubled. He did get held up by the crash, but of course, everyone ends up at the same time. Shall we finish things there, chaps? Um, Daniel, you get anything more to let's add? Let's do it. Let's do it. We've got a bit of a drive, haven't we, to our hotel tonight, so let's head off. Francois, thank you very much. Hope you'll be able to join us again. Yeah. No, last thing, I think tomorrow we'll know if Chris Room is going to win the World Cup. It's the ideal finish for him. And if he wins it, and he, I think he'll win it rather easily, then we'll know. I agree. On that note, thank you, Francois. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs>